Well, I'm excited to continue this series. We had a wonderful uh, break. I had a wonderful break last week listening to my dear brother, Pastor Jamal Bernard, and helping us really, you know, as we've been reflecting this month about how we need to look to Jesus for answers, there are going to be times when people come to us for answers because they may not be able to get to God, but they can get to you, and they're going to be asking us questions about our faith, and we really need to be equipped to respond, and so uh, Pastor Jamal really helped us move in that direction, so I hope you were taking good notes, and check out the video online as well to, to refresh yourself with that. Um, but we're going to continue with this theme here of I didn't sign up for this uh, and uh, what to do when the abnormal becomes normal, our next installment here. And uh, I, I want to review a little bit of what I was talking about before uh, last week. We were looking at the sports analogy. We were, we were looking at the dream team and uh, we were looking at analogies between the dream team and our own situation to give us a sense. I told the story of when the dream team was practicing, uh, their coach uh, actually had them play against a college team and they ended up losing. I mean, that is basketball icons today. Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, and many others who are in the Hall of Fame today lost to a college basketball team for the same reasons that we could find ourselves disillusioned today if we don't take note. So we talked about the fact that there were three, uh, there were three sports principles that we applied to our spiritual life. The first was play for the name on the front of the jersey and not the back. The second was discern the magnitude and urgency of the moment. And the third was you can be beat. Just showing up is not enough. And then we correlated those spiritual principles, those sports principles to spiritual principles, which is the goal is not to get back to normal, but to get back to God. Right. So we need to God is the name. God is the name on the front of the jersey. We need to be playing for him, not for our individual desires and things. And so there's a lot at stake today in our world, particularly with an election coming up. And that's often a time where people are like, gimme, gimme, gimme. This is what I want. This is what I want to see. But here's the question. What does God want? And when you go to the polls, when you are exploring where you're casting your ballot and how you're doing things, are you thinking in terms of what God wants or what you want? That's the question today, right? The second thing that we talked about where we correlated spiritually was discerning the context. The dream team when they were playing that college team, did not discern the magnitude and urgency of the moment, right? They were playing for the United States of America. They weren't just playing for an NBA championship. They were playing for their country. And at that moment, they weren't discerning the magnitude of it, right? We need to discern that we're in a special moment. This is not a normal time at all, right? Even though there have been times in national and global history in which there has been crisis, I think most people agree this is different and we need to discern the times and then recognize what the scripture tells us to how we need to have our posture spiritually to respond. And then finally, of course, the third point was you can be beat. Right. As we look at as we look at this current situation, what we're seeing that in our natural power. Right. We can be beat. We can't just show up. We've got to depend on God. And so the spiritual principle was distinguished between the things you can control and the things you can't control, which is the jumping off point for the new material we're presenting today. OK, especially as we head into this election, there are some things you can control and there are some things you can't control. Right. You got to know the difference. You got to know the difference. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, as I was, I was responding to the, 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 you know, at the time we were talking about Pastor John MacArthur and his church and how they were made a decision to have essentially a peaceful, a civil disobedience, if you would, and not responding to the county ordinance to social dances and what have you. And what, I didn't comment on the right or wrongness of that. I just, what I, but, but what I said was, what I said was that as we look at the scripture, of course, Pastor John has to do for him, for in his congregation, what God tells him to do. But we looked at the scripture where it talked about a couple of scriptures, Psalms, Psalms 37, as well as the parable about the tares and the wheat. And the message we got from that is that God sees the wicked people just like we do. And what does he say? Don't worry about them. I got them. Don't worry about them. 
right? There are all kinds of things going on in the world, and there are wicked things that our eyes can see, but the Lord is telling us, don't fret about wicked people. Their time is coming, okay? So what do we do in the meantime? Well, here's some perspective for you, okay? So first of all, this new normal, right, this, this, this new reality, okay, or let me say this, what we call normal, what we, the thing that we've been disrupted from, the thing that many of us want to go back to, right, really camouflages a spiritual reality. So the reality is we were never actually safe and comfortable. It just looked like it. It just felt like it because, you know, you could just walk into the store and, and get your milk or, you know, go to your little Starbucks and you go to school and, and you have your little routines and it makes us feel like it's normal. But the reality was it never was normal. Why? Because it's camouflaging a spiritual reality that now is made visible to us. These these crisis moments naturally and global, nationally and globally are actually reflections of spiritual conflicts. And here is that reality. We sit in the middle of a cosmic battle between good and evil. We sit in the middle of a cosmic battle between good and evil. And when things look normal, they're merely camouflaging the fact that we are actually in that battle. In fact, in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us what to look for as the culmination of this class clash draws near. I'm not going to go to that passage. We've looked at it multiple times in this series, but he talks about changes in the atmosphere, famines and earthquakes and pestilences and rumors of wars and kingdom against kingdom and nation against nation. And even at some point, right, where there would be such there would be a murderous hate with respect to Christians around the world. In some cases, some people being martyred for their faith. These are the things that would be happening. So as we see this, we shouldn't be surprised. There is a clear scriptural pattern in which natural disasters, large-scale global events, and socioeconomic disheaval become clear signs that we are drawing closer to God's normal. God's normal. God's normal is not our normal. God's normal is a new heaven and a new earth. It's not this earth. It's a different earth, and this clash is that battle that will eventually lead us to that new reality. And so the reality is, is that really when we come to worship and when we come to, and when we come to be disciples of Jesus, we should be uh, taking, partaking in foretastes or a foretaste of that new reality. It's almost like an appetizer. It's not the full experience, but the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives us a foretaste of the reality to come, and that should set the barometer for what normal is, not what is going on around us on our job and in our neighborhood. Now, as this battle is culminating, right, we are two things, both casualties of war and beneficiaries of the ultimate victor, Jesus. I'm going to explain that in a second, but let me say it again. In this battle between good and evil, we are both casualties of war and beneficiaries of the ultimate victor, Jesus. Let me first talk about the casualty. I like the way I'm going to... We had uh, Pastor uh, Jamal Bernard here last week. I want to refer to something his father, Dr. Bernard, mentioned on his program uh, a few months ago. And he talked about, in fact, as, as he was talking about and expounding upon his own recovery from COVID, and he's certainly doing well now. He recovered from it. But as he was talking about it, he was explaining the fact that he was interpreting our experience in this life as casualties, because the battle between good and evil is not really a battle between God and humans. It's between God and the devil, which preceded our creation. And it's a battle that continues to this day. And so when we become subject to Satan's devices, what we really are are casualties of a war that really has nothing to do with us except the fact that we are God's kids. And that is why he has mercy on us. Because he knows that was not his, ori his original intent was not to go to war with his kids. 
But he knew the devil got in and he took us hostage. So there's this battle going on and people become casualties because they become subject to sin and getting in the flesh and becoming worldly, not understanding that Satan is taking them hostage. But here's the other aspect of that. God in his mercy died for us, gives us the Holy Spirit, and we now become beneficiaries of the ultimate victor, which is why we can have peace. So here's the reality. The Bible tells us we know how this is going to end. We win. Don't worry. The the wicked people will be dealt with. So the issue is, what do we do in the meantime? The issue is enduring the process until ultimate goodness is achieved and wickedness is punished. But it's hard to stay still in the process, isn't it? As we're anxious about what's going to happen in November, for example, about what's going to happen with corona, about what's going to happen with the racial issues, about what's going to happen with the economy. It's tempting to get in the flesh and to be worried and to be anxious and to wonder, is there really a God? But the Lord invites us to have peace. Let me tell you some things that will help us to have peace. So this should motivate us. The reality that we are ultimate victors in Christ Jesus should motivate us to do two things. Number one, brace for disruptions in our way of life. We're just getting started. Matthew 24 says these are just the beginning of sorrows and birth pains. Brace ourselves for disruptions in our lives. It didn't say one pestilence, it says, mo- it says plural pestilences in Matthew 24. It talks about famines, it talks about earthquakes, it talks about wars and rumors of wars. There will be more things going on, but we take peace in the fact that, number two, we have confidence that in Jesus we have roots in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now let me remind you of a song we all, most of us know from Sunday school or singing in the children's choir, right? He's got the whole world in his hands, right? We sing it as a song, but do we believe it? Do we believe that he has the United States in his hands, that he has Russia in his hands, that he has North Korea in his hands, that he has the government, that he has the NBA in his hands, that he has the economy in his hands? Do we believe that? We were reminded, not so much last week, but two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, that the church is in God's hands. Not only is the church in God's hands, but catch this, human history is in God's hands. Human history is in God's hands. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, before I make the next statement, let me just clarify that our theological position here is we believe that there is such a thing as free will. I recognize that there are people that I respect Uh, who love the Lord and are faithful to the Scripture, have a different view. Like there are people, for example, from Reformed churches or maybe Calvinist, and they have a different view. They don't believe that we have human free will. They believe that God decides everything beforehand, that he decides who's going to be saved and not going to be saved. I'm not going to get into that theology, okay, because there's some people I respect who believe that, and I respectfully disagree because of my interpretation, but I just want to acknowledge that there are other interpretations of this. But as I get into this, Our theology is that we believe that there is a free will. So, while human beings have free will, I do believe that. Check this out. God shapes the course of human events in such a way that they will eventually culminate in a new heaven and a new earth. So, yes, we have a free will, but in the process of that, God is still shaping the course of human events. This should give us confidence, but let me talk about how this is playing out or how we have proof of this scripturally. First of all, one of the most direct ways that God shapes human history is by making his authority accessible to humanity, even the people who don't serve him. I'm going to say that again. God makes his own authority accessible to humanity, but not just the part of humanity who believes he exists and loves him and serves him, accessible to anybody in the earth. What does that mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Romans in a second, but what I mean by that is that whenever somebody steps into authority, particularly at high levels, 
They're in God's yard. <laughs> so they immediately step into a situation that he is directly controlling. I'm going to say more about that later, but before, let me establish this principle that authority belongs to God. Romans 13, 1 through 6, it says this, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by who? By God. Every authority. That means Russia's authority, United States authority, North Korea, Australia, Nigeria, Ghana, China, Japan, the county, <laughs> your supervisor, all authority has been instituted. It's his authority. We use it, but it's his. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Why? It belongs to him. And those who resist will incur judgment. This is why, as believers, there's a certain respect we have for who is sitting in office because we see it as that's God's chess piece. The person in the piece may be a fallible human being who's wicked, but it's God's chess piece. So I'm going to respect his chess piece. Let's continue. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. In other words, the intent of government is to do good, not evil, though some people do evil, but the intent is good. Would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So in principle, it's talking both about the government and in this place, it's talking about actually law enforcement here, right? I'm not stating this to make comments about the specific police brutality controversy specifically. I'm just laying out the fact that all authority, even the authority of the police, comes from God. So, when we engage with any kind of authority as a believer, we have to say, God, how do I honor you in this situation? And given the injustices we're experiencing and respond to the injustice. How do I do that? How do I have a respect, God, for your authority while responding to people who are abusing your authority? Sometimes that's a case-by-case -case scenario led by the Holy Spirit. But as Christians, we don't get to ignore Romans chapter 13. We've got to wrestle with that. Why? Because we honor God. Verse 5, therefore one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. I know some people try to evade taxes. The tax authorities come from who? The Lord. So if you know you are robbing God by not paying your taxes, puts it in another context, doesn't it? Because you've got to trust that even if they're overtaxing you, God's got you. See, your integrity is your insurance policy. I would rather pay more money. I would rather pay the fee than know that I've been crooked because the person may not see me, but God sees me. I'm honoring him. Let's keep it going. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. As Christians, we have to do our part. Now, if someone, a government official, the IRS, or police officer begins to not do their part, okay, then we address that as it emerges. But when we, in the situation, we have to have the mindset that, God, wherever your authority is present, I'm going to at least do that so that I can, so that I can take, partake in your intervention. When we take matters in our own hands, we, we, we shrug off God's intervention. 
I would rather follow what God is asking me so that I can have access to his help when I need it. And again, I'm not, this is not a comment about specific instances with cops. I'm talking about a specific principle and how it plays out specifically will be different on the situation. But as believers, we're still accountable to what the scripture says about how we respond to authority. Let's continue. When human beings accept authority, particularly at its highest levels, I was talking about this before, they are putting themselves in God's yard where he is playing chess. So let me tell you something. Authority figures that look like they're getting away with things, they aren't. They're playing into God's hands because he uses them as his chess pieces. Check this out. Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. And what does it say God does? He turns it whatever he wills. See, people seek power But they don't realize that when they become president or king or queen or prime minister, they become God's pawn. He turns their heart the way he wants to. Why? Because you just put yourself in my yard. Let's continue here. Ironically, the pursuit of power outside of God places you directly under God's control. So like what I said, people are seeking to control, have power, they get to the top. But ironically, that's exactly where God has, he's going to use you as his pawn, whether you're wicked or good. This is why Paul places a special emphasis on praying for people in authority, particularly heads of state particularly has to say, because the higher the authority, the more directly you're in God's hands with respect to the way he's manipulating human history, because he's manipulating human history through uh, national policy. What does it say in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2? It says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Yes, all people. And then he emphasizes this, for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Why? Because God uses kings and presidents and prime ministers to shape policy in such a way that it moves human history in the direction God wants it to go. So you are, get to participate in that. God controls it, but we participate in that through our prayers. So you may or may not like the current president. You may or may not like the next president, if it's a different president. But you still must pray for him. Because whoever they are, God's going to use them, not because he likes them, but because they in his yard. <laughs> you in my yard, you're going to do what I want you to do. Heads of state often unknowingly place themselves squarely in God's domain and become God's pawns by default. Let's do some examples. I may not read all these scriptures, but here's some examples. We see in Genesis 12, 17, 17 through 20, Pharaoh is warned by God. Notice Pharaoh is a king, head of state. <laughs> This is an example, uh, you know, the, the, this is one of the situations where Abraham is w- going through Egypt with his wife, Sarah, and his wife is so fine <laughs> that he's concerned that the, the people in Egypt or Pharaoh will, 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 will want to marry her, even though that, you know, she is married to him, that they, they, they rode like that. So he just, so he didn't want to be in trouble. So what he does is say, well, just say you're my sister. Just, and then don't, don't, just like, I, so we won't have to deal with all that. And, you know, you know, and, 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 and God wasn't having it. Why? Because Sarah, just like Abraham, was picked by God to be, to be the parents of the great, 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 great grandparents of Jesus. Several more greats than that, but you get the idea. So that generational line could not be tainted by Pharaoh. Sarah had a special place. That couldn't happen. And so God himself goes to Pharaoh. It says, verse 17, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? 
Now here, now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. God is dealing. Pharaoh didn't worship God. But God has access to him because he's a head of state. God goes directly to him. God got a red phone that goes straight, that goes straight to every head of state, and he talks to them anytime he wants to. He influences them anytime he wants to. He shapes their heart anytime he wants to. We're going to keep going. Another Pharaoh in Exodus 7, 3 through 5. What do we learn? God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Who is Pharaoh? A head of state. Verse 3, it says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh would not listen to you. Why? Because I made him like that. Isn't that something? It, 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 you would think that, why would God do that? But, but he's using Pharaoh because he want to use the hardness of Pharaoh's heart so that he can show how great he is in Egypt. Because if Pharaoh doesn't resist God, then God doesn't have a reason to do all these plagues and shame all the Egyptian gods. All of those, most or not all those plagues were, there, there was some aspect of that that connected to Egyptian worship. And every time he did a plague, it wasn't just to show off. It was to say, and that God is nothing, and that God is nothing. I'm Lord over that. I'm Lord over everything you think is God. So we see in verse 4, it says, Pharaoh will not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt. In verse 5, it says, the Egyptians, this is what he wanted, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. That's why I harden his heart, so that they will know that I am the Lord. See, you're thinking, we're thinking like, God, why don't you just get rid of Pharaoh? Why, why would you let his heart get hardened? Why? Because God has another strategy. He sees the whole chessboard. You worried about November, God sees past November. <laughs> you, you, you thinking, well, if my candidate don't get in, or if this other candidate wins, it's not about that. God has that all handled. And some, many times his strategy is counterintuitive. Look at Romans 9, 17 through 18. It says, for the scripture says the Pharaoh... For this very purpose, I have raised you up. What's that say? God raised up Pharaoh. Didn't he raise up Moses too? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Aren't they enemies? Well, who's God, whose side is God on? His own. They're both his chess pieces. They're both his chess pieces. He raised Pharaoh. That was God's doing. And he raised up Moses. But why did he do it? For this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, so that he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Why? God's playing chess. Because he has an end game, a new heaven and a new earth, and he wants to enlist as many people into that as possible, but the way he plays chess is not going to make sense in terms of our concept of right and wrong and justice. It's not. Why? Because God's objective, because he sees everything. We just see a part. I'm going to give you some more examples. God raises up Nebuchadnezzar to rule and oppress. Doesn't it say that? Jeremiah 28, 14. It says, for this for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put upon the neck of all these nations an iron yoke to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was a colonizer that God raised up. Why would God do that? Because he's playing his own game. He has his reasons that exceed our understanding. Now, in this case, we know that the children of Israel are being rebellious, and so all those other kind of things in context, you see that. But we see that there are wicked people or people who don't serve God that God raises up for his purpose. Let's keep going. God stirs up Cyrus to authorize the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. Cyrus did not worship God, but God talked to him, though. Ezra 1, 1 through 2, it says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. The Lord of this person who did not worship God, he stirred up his spirit. 
of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom, throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing. Let me make it official. Verse 2, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me. This king who doesn't serve God, he says, but God has charged me. What does God tell him? Has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Why? Because Cyrus, as powerful as he was, was still God's pawn. But check this out. <laughs> we don't live in a time, we don't live in a country where there's a king and queen, do we? We live in a democratic system, but guess what the Bible says? Even the democratic voting process is shaped by God. Proverbs 16, 33, what does it say? The lot is cast. The lot is cast. So I don't know who you're going to vote for, you're going to decide. He says the lot is cast into the lap. But it's, but it's every decision is from the Lord. We're all going to vote, but the decision comes from God. How you like them apples? That's why we can rest. Like, God, who is this? You, who is in office running out of the, the? You playing chess, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to pray for whoever is elected. Why? Because God sees everything. See, you think the person you're going to vote for is just going to be the answer. What if it's the person you didn't vote for? Then what you going to do? In either case, whose game is it? God's? Whose chess pieces are they? God's? And what did he tell us in Psalm 37? Don't fret. God shapes national and international policy, but not on our terms. It's not on our terms. And newsflash, he's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's not a third party supporter or an independent. He's only on his side. God is only on his side. Now, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me explain here. Joshua 5, 13 through 15, just before they went to the battle of Jericho, right? Joshua sees an angel. Verse 13, it says, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us? Or for our adversaries. Isn't that what we want to know? You see somebody, well, who are you voting for? Are you conservative or are you liberal? Are you Republican or are you Democrat? You like Biden or you like Trump? What's, what's your deal? And what does the angel say? And he said, no, which really means neither. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. In other words, I'm on God's side. And Joshua fell on his face. And to the earth and worship and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? That's what we need to say at the voting booth. Lord, what are you saying to your servant? Folks, there's folks who love Jesus on the right. There's folks who love Jesus on the left. And all God is asking us to do is to make decisions in the light we have. How he uses all that is up to him. When we stand before him, he's going to hold us accountable. He said, you had this much light to see this. Were you faithful with the light I gave you to do that? Because he may have raised up the right and the left together and using him for his purposes, and we don't see it. So the person on the right may be doing what they're supposed to do, playing their role, and the person on the left may be doing what they're supposed to do, playing their role, and, but the outcome is God's. So be faithful to what you know and understand about God and have peace. We're well, almost done here. We should follow Joshua's example and just surrender to the victor now. <laughs> who going to win? God. Well, who you think going to win? Trump or Biden? Neither. God's going to win because this is his 
game. He's shaping everything. Our next president may do something that's crazier than what's going on right now. But guess who will still be in control? God. God's in control. Let's make it easy on ourselves and surrender to the victor now. Let's give God our hearts. Now, before I make a formal appeal to come to Jesus, I just, I'm saying this in the context of this. We need to give God our hearts with respect to this election. And say, Lord, I, I, I got, I'm anxious about this. I want this. I want that. But here's my heart. Tell me how I should choose. And I will go that way. Help me to discern. Help me to see. Help me to like, I'm going to listen to that voice on my heart. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meditate on the word and let you speak to me. And then tell me the direction I should go. The answer he puts on your heart may not be what you think he'll tell you. It might not. But if it's from the Lord, you can have peace regardless of how the election turns out. Even if the person you vote for doesn't get elected, you would still have done what God told you to do. In other words, you'll be playing your role in how God is shaping human history. Remember, he didn't just raise up Moses. He also raised up Pharaoh. And those crazy folks you see on television talking heads, who knows how God's using that? Who knows? But we can put our confidence Some of you are here this morning and you've never ever given your heart to the Lord. You've pretty much been doing your own thing. And that can sometimes happen even when you have been a churchgoer for years or you may have grown up in a Christian family or, you know, you may have been doing Christian practices, but you do church things, but then you go back and do your own thing. You really haven't given your heart to the Lord. You have an opportunity this morning to do that. Some of you have never been a part of a uh, uh, made any kind of formal or informal commitment to the Lord, and maybe for the first time, you're saying, I need to do that. You know, it's really simple to invite Jesus to be your Lord and your master. That's, that's not the hard part. The more difficult part is simply giving him your heart. Letting go of all the things that give you anguish. Because when we have anguish, we, wanna, we just want to control. We're like, we, we look for places, things we can control. But this morning, God wants you to give him the control. So that's you, either a person who's never, ever made a formal or informal commitment to God, or you're a person who is, you've been a part of Christianity in some way, but you still kind of do your own thing. I want to lead you in a prayer that says, you know, I want to settle it once and for all. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. If that's you, I want you to repeat after me. Dear God, I come to you now and I invite Jesus to be my Lord, my master, my savior. I believe he died on the cross for my sins and shed his blood. And that when he died for me, he buried my sins. And then when he was resurrected, he had complete victory over my sin. And because of that, he gives me the power to live a righteous life. So right now, Jesus, I invite you in my heart. Holy Spirit, fill me with your love and with your power that I can live a righteous life. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer for the very first time, first of all, I'm excited for what's in store for you. 
because now you've given God the opportunity to show you things you couldn't see before, to hear things you couldn't hear before, and really to have more peace, because this world is doing all kinds of things. But when you have Jesus, there's a peace that passes your understanding. The second thing that I'm excited about is that if you text the number on your screen, if you text Zoe Save to the number on your screen, we'll have the capacity to follow up with you and give you some materials and things that will help you in this journey of, of, of drawing closer to God. It's vital that we do these things because the more the world changes, the more it's clear that the realities that matter are spiritual and eternal. Have a wonderful, blessed Sunday. And let the Lord keep peace in your heart. God bless you.